Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to the latest Shiny podcast. This is uh, Stephen Spector, and with me is Rob Hirschfeld as well. Uh, hello, Steven. Rob. Hello, Stephen. So happy this end of year. Will, happy end of year. So this will be the uh, end of 2000, uh, God, what are we, 2017, uh, our end of year podcast. And um, as we head into 2018, um, the podcast has been going a few months, Rob, and I, I have to say we've had good guests and and we're closing out on a thousand uh, listens, which is not bad for a new podcast. That's awesome. And if you're listening, help spread the word. Uh, we this is a non-commercial. We're not promoting people. We don't have people promoting themselves. So it's a pretty unique podcast. We've we've way exceeded uh, the guest, the the quality and ca- caliber of the guests that Stephen's been able to wrangle into the show have been stunning. So um, you, it's. It's hard to it's hard to it's hard to know how much work Stephen puts in making all this stuff happen and and Stephen thank you. It's no, great. it's it's my pleasure and it's fun to harass people and and uh, you know as we start to look into next year I have some guests that are quite amazing that you probably haven't heard before but have just really unique perspectives and um, we've got some we've got a college professors we've got researchers we've got. Uh, Jim Plamondon, which I'll, uh, to me is going to be one of the biggie podcasts. And, you know, he's rather famous if you search him in the early days of building platforms, building communities. And Jim is quite a character. Editing that podcast, I think, might be the challenge of my life. Makes, makes, makes me want to go get a bucket of fried chicken to watch it. But. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're going to have to wait. But, I, I, you know, you suggested to me that we do an end of year podcast. And one of the cool things that uh, – that you have, I'm, I'm really interested in is at the end of 2016, you wrote a blog on robhirschfield.com, you know, saying what you think was going to happen. And now that we've right. hit the end of the year, I think it's a good idea. I, I like your idea. Let's review what you thought was going to happen, where we thought things were going and where things are now. I, I think it's good to keep us honest as we prognosticate to the future. Uh, track records are useful. Um, wow. So, so the, the, and we'll leave, we should leave the reading of the blog post to the readers. Um, but as a summary, I, de- I described year 2017 was going to be the year of the crawfish, IT crawfish, um, which is this idea that in any forward action you take, you need to have an escape clause. So people build in a, if this plan doesn't work, I need to switch to a backup plan as part, which is a good idea anyway. Um, but what what that translates to in in our in my opinion last year was hybriding, um, that we would see hybrid is is much more mainstreamed than it was, um, so that you would have cloud contingency plans, you'd be operating in multiple places and creating portability. Um, I think the word see, was everywhere. I mean, hybrid cloud, hybrid cloud. You know, you look at social media, everyone's like, your answer is hybrid cloud, but. Yes. I don't, I don't know if I hear that as much anymore. Maybe it's just me, but it seems to have, it's, it's definitely not as vocal that, that expression as it used to be. I, I don't know. I mean, I went, I went to two Gartner events. Um, You're still talking hybrid this, this year. Oh my goodness. It's it, what we've transitioned from is hybrid a good idea to you are hybrid. Let's cope with it. Um, and so from that perspective, I, I think that, it's not necessarily contingency plan. It's just seen as the reality on the ground. Um, but it's, it's very much the, the factor today in, in, in IT design, not necessarily because people want it, um, but because it's, you know, it's sort of been, they, they're, they're in multiple places, they're using multiple services, they're, they're making choices like that. Um, although at the same time, we've seen a lot more consolidation around container schedulers with Kubernetes than I was expecting. Um, you know, it, it feels to me like the, the cloud race, sorry, Google, but is, is becoming a little bit more of an Amazon Microsoft story. Um, but you still see, you know, interesting players doing interesting things down in the, the next tier down. Um, and then amazingly, the, the thing that I heard at KubeCon uh, we haven't highlighted that that hard yet is this hybrid um, story where a big cloud vendor runs your control plane and then you you bring the nodes. Um, and I think you know that's those issues seem like they're going to be um, 
very popular issues for 2018. So it's sort of this, I am hybrid. What, what's it, what's it, you know, how do I cope with that? How do I, I put nodes in on premises and colo and different, you know, how do I have, this sounds sort of crazy to me, but how do I have my Google control plane running my Amazon nodes? Um, and then, so, and then creating a network between it. Yeah. So it's trying to bring everything together so you can manage it wherever it goes. Is that a way to look at? Uh, it's a way, yeah. Um, it's a way, you know, we're trying to connect everything together to create a more seamless IT infrastructure without having a single IT infrastructure. Um, but, oh my goodness, the idea of the networking complexity with that and security complexity and uh, I don't think we're there yet. I think we're going to be we're going to be struggling with that in twenty in twenty eighteen. It sounds really cool for a service provider to offer it, um, but the more things that you have to manage, the harder it gets to provide a, a good infrastructure. And so, uh, complexity is you know complexity is IT's and speed's enemy. Um, but is the complexity? It seems to me that complexity keeps getting pushed down. And the end user, I hate to use that term, but the person that's trying to run all the, that's not the person running it, but the person using it, it's simplified for them. And it's almost like, let's make things uh, easier up the stack, but down the stack, it's so much more complicated that the people actually having to implement it are the ones really suffering. Phew. I think that's a good observation. I'm, I'm struggling through different layers on this, right? Because uh, Kubernetes can provide this sort of abstraction boundary. So if you're writing an application to be delivered in Kubernetes, then maybe what you're saying is true that, that I'm just targeting this platform and then implementing the platform is, is left as an exercise to the reader. Um, and then there's plenty of ways that you can do Kubernetes platforms very simply using these cloud providers. But I think when you get to scale, an ops team, you're right. This is where an ops team is going to have to pick up the complexity of running it in in a more scaled out environment. Um, and and I think the the ahead. ops team is interesting because I know at the at the early of the year, SRE site reliability engineering seemed like it was kind of it was going to burst on the scene. I, I don't know if that's the the right way to say it, but just seemed like there was a lot of talk about SRE was going to be a thing and. And it was, I don't want to say it was replacing DevOps, but it was kind of sitting on DevOps. And I, I, I get the feeling that other than looking for jobs, and I remember I wrote a post once that I went looking for DevOps jobs and, and site reliability engineering jobs, and there are no more DevOps jobs. It's almost all site reliability engineering, but you don't really see anyone talk about site reliability. It's all still DevOps. So we should, we should put this into context, right? At the beginning yeah. of the year, Google came out with the book site reliability engineering, and it, it attracted a lot of attention. People were very excited about it. I was certainly very excited about it. Um, and um, they actually, I think, set the copyright so that people could just download electronic copies. They, they really did a good job sort of publicizing what was going on. Um, and yeah, so there was a ton of buzz around SREs. I think a lot of people now have SRE job titles, um, but, going into the back half of the year, it didn't seem to be generating as much enthusiasm. Um, you didn't see as many blog posts. You didn't see people sort of consolidating around tooling for SREs. Um, and that's, that's sort of where, I, you know, I was hoping from an operations perspective that we'd actually see SRE become a, you know, actually, let me take a step back from this before I make this comment. So DevOps, one of the, the, the patterns in DevOps is that DevOps conferences, speakers, and events, and books typically don't like to talk about the tools they use. <laughs> DevOps is a process yeah. culture. Uh, and SRE, since it's a job, or, you know, it, it felt like they would be more willing, and we would be more willing to talk about, this is how I did this task, this is how I built my data center, this is how I do things. Um, and so that sort of idea of SRE focused tooling and automation and, and um, materials uh, hasn't consolidated the way I was expecting. Um, 
it to do. Uh, I, I think some of that's been carried up in cloud native. And so there may be, maybe the SRE thing is confused by cloud native. Um, so the cloud native infrastructure book by Justin Garrison and Chris Nova, um, which I had the, the pleasure of being a, a guest editor on or guest proofreader, um, you know, really comes through and starts to talk about how infrastructure is defined. Uh, it's an interesting read. Uh, and it, it is reflected in, in Chris's project, Kubicorn. Um, uh, we, we could actually do it. We should probably get Chris and Justin on in a podcast and, and talk about that. Um, Good idea. There's, things that like, there's things that the Racken team likes about it, and there's things that the Racken team um, is scratching their head about because it, we, we like to see composability. Um, it turns out composability is super hard. So uh, I'm going to parent that's not an end of year prediction stuff. That's just a, if you're, if you're looking at things and they're not composable, hold off, stop, pause. Um, all right, so we're, we're, we want to wrap the 2017 stuff and look to 2018 and I'm getting off track. That's okay. I wanted to just say for on the SRE subject, we, uh, we yep. are going to sponsor uh, SRE Con 18, which is in, yeah. uh, in uh, I think it's March, if I'm not confusing all these events I've been looking at in um, Santa Clara. And uh, there's some pretty big name sponsors, you know, Racken's name is going to be next to eBay and Google and, uh, you know, some of these uh, uh, Netflix. So clearly, you know, Racken fits right in that community. But um, it'll be really interesting to go there. And I think what we'll try to do at the event is see if we can't get some folks there to record some local podcasts and, and really do, do some in-depth uh, SRE discussion with uh, you know, real leaders and see if we can't get one of the big names from Google. The, I mean, the simple, the simple thing about SRE is that it didn't go away. People got to work. And sometimes when that happens, it doesn't create a big, a big bubble of excitement. It's just there's a whole bunch of people doing this job now, settling into the title and getting the work done. And, and frankly, operators in work mode generally don't. Yeah, well, they, they're not <laughs> out there. The they're not out there trying to build a movement. They're just building infrastructure. Yes. Maybe that's it. The difference in DevOps and SRE is one is more of a marketing thing. Uh, it has a hype, marketing hype, and one is just operators getting their job done. Well, we'll find out. I think. Uh, there is. I would, I, would, I would like to see SRE as a rallying cry to talk about the tools and, and utilities and things like that. And uh, along the lines to wrap up to the 2017, yeah. Uh, from a hybrid, a hybrid perspective, which we went into the year super excited about, um, Racken made a business decision to actually pull out our hybrid capabilities and focus on metal only. So we actually, um, from an investment perspective of time and time and, and effort, really felt that the solving the hybrid problem um, was much more complex, was not going to be single tool. Um, and we we went back to doing what we really do well, which is our the physical infrastructure side of this thing. And then we saw tools like Terraform, which we've done some blog posts, blog, uh, podcasts about. Um, in that space, solving solving problems for people, um, it, but yet not creating you know real portability. So hybrid's not done um, by any stretch. We we think that it's going to take some rethinking uh, and better understanding how people do their work. Um, and that so, might be just right. 2018. Yeah. So let, let's move into next year with the um, kind of what you're thinking. I know, I guess if we start with bare metal, I mean, if we look at AWS reinvent and I know mm -hmm. we put a post out, you know, they announced bare metal and your blog post was interesting was everyone just said, okay, it's there, but it wasn't like, but then again, AWS put out so many announcements, hard to know what in the world to focus <laughs> on. That was like 30 companies releasing all their products in one day. I don't think I want to work so there as a developer. But we're, what are your we're, thoughts? Hearing, we're hearing something super interesting um, as a consequence of the bare metal, and it has nothing to do with the bare metal. Um, what, what we're seeing is there's an emerging portability pattern for cloud users, and portability is a huge word. So I would say hybrid, hybrid of 2017 has transitioned to portability in 2018. And we're gonna stop talking hybrid as much as start talking much more about, is this portable? Um, because people are just baking hybrid into their assumptions. Um, 
And what we're seeing and what the, the I3 Metal announcement re reinforces is people are delivering immutable images in cloud infrastructure in general. So Dockerized containers are considered immutable. Uh, AMIs, which is a, the Amazon um, server image, um, those are immutable, right? They, they, they come pre-packaged, you put everything in it and you deliver it and then you do minimal configuration and then you throw it away when you need to change it. You don't patch it. That's my, my very short immutable definition. Um, but so are we that, gonna, I was just yeah. gonna say, you're gonna stake out 2018 is a year of immutable. Can we, should we put the Oh my the goodness, that, maybe, yes. Let's, I'll, I would, I'll drive that stake in on 2018, yes. Okay. Um, I, I, although I think a lot of people don't like that term, um, but maybe, maybe people come to love it in 2018. Um, but it's definitely the year of image-based deployments from that perspective. Um, and, and so this is the takeaway from the Amazon metal is not that they have metal. If you, if you need what they offer, they do, but their, their VMs are pretty optimized already. It's what we, I've been hearing. The thing that's powerful is they expect you to show up to use that metal with an image. And so to the extent that you are able to manage image-based deployments, you can use their metal service. Um, and one of the things I believe very strongly is that, I, that Amazon sets the, the pattern for IT ops. And so Amazon, this metal thing is much more gonna be about, oh, I have to deliver images to, for deployments, not configured machines using traditional bootstraps. Um, and that's, that's a much bigger impact to operators and SREs than what they're used to doing, which is much more traditional IT. So does that mean virtualization goes away? I, I, maybe that's a dumb question. Ah, but that's a good question. No, I know, what, what I know we hinted at that sometime this year. <laughs> we never came back to it, but are we moving to the world where virtualization doesn't really add value? We're moving to a world where managing metal servers and managing virtual servers is functionally equivalent. And then the need to put virtualization on top in order to get that, that portability has, has diminished. And that's, that's the key thing, right? If you can buy a cheap metal server and, and run it like, like a VM by just imaging the server and, and turning it over every, every week or every, you know, however fast you want to rotate your machines, um, an inexpensive metal server with, is, you know, you're going to get a lot of small, fast machines as cheap as you can get virtual machines. And I'm going to stop and t talk about that for a second. So virtualized hardware is expensive hardware. It usually has big RAM, it usually has really fast disks, it's got big networks, it's got redundancies in it, right? Usually you, you need bigger, if you're gonna virtualize, you get bigger machines. And if you were gonna say, well, wait a second, I just want, instead of carving one big expensive machine up, I'm gonna buy four small machines. Um, the, those small machines are actually cheaper, much cheaper than the one big because they, they don't have the redundancy in parts. They don't have all the scale up stuff. You can actually get away with smaller machines in those cases. And the economics flips, and then you're not paying for virtualization and you're not paying for sure. It's the story, it's like there's a whole bunch of stuff that just right. sinks out of your cost structure. So um, I rem yeah, so Rob, yeah. I remember in, when I was at HP, they had, um, before we split and stuff, they had something called moonshot servers. And uh -huh. Do you, I don't know if, if you remember, or people remember, but it, it seemed a couple of years ago that the trend was is people were going to go to these uh, servers that had tons of, I can't think of the processors, they're, they're the small ARM. processors, ARM mm -hmm. chips. And, ARM, and, yeah. and these things were, you could have so many more ARM chips within a single server and that you actually just run your entire app on that single ARM. Is, is that kind of one of those things that went into the the trough of disillusionment maybe comes back then? We keep waiting for ARM to come back. The challenge with ARM is that it's architecturally, every year's the year of ARM returning and Linux on the desktop. Oh, okay, um, I was gonna say if it's, okay, <laughs> so now I know, okay, then, then I have to, if it's the Linux on the desktop, then I get No, that. it's not, it's, um, it's, it's, it's a joke. Um, I, and, I'm, and I'm a Linux desktop sufferer, so. Um, 
uh, <laughs> um, as, as everybody on my team knows, as they watch me struggle with, with PowerPoint presentations and sharing the information on the on screens and stuff. Um, <laughs> and it works. It's great. It's awesome. Everybody should do it. Uh, no, the, the problem with the problem with ARM um, architecture in this case is that you ha you, you actually have to recompile. Um, and so, if you're doing immutable infrastructure on ARM, all of a sudden you have to deal with the architecture of the platform you're targeting. And ARM has different. There's enough differences in ARM right now that it's it's actually pretty painful. So, I keep talking to ARM vendors, and if you're an ARM vendor listening to this, call Racken. We'll help you with operationalizing it. But they don't. The, the, so far, most ARM vendors are hardware vendors. They don't think about the operational challenges that they have to resolve. Um, and so uh, if, if you don't make something easy to use, only real diehards will, will use it. It's the too high a barrier. So, and so. so can you make an Intel server then? A slimmed down kind of Intel? Oh, yeah. Intel? No, they do. Yeah, they're totally. Okay. Uh, you know, our, our friends at, at Packet, um, we did a nice pro uh, podcast with them yeah. uh, months ago um, have a type what they call type zero uh, which are these tiny little Intel based servers and super cheap very easy to use um, you know cheaper than a VM frankly for a comparable system and that's that's powerful but we're getting a far field yeah <laughs> okay keep going uh, no, I mean, so, so I think 2018, you know, from our perspective, immutability and image-based deployments are a very, very big deal. Um, so, you know, I, I think we're still watching where serverless goes uh, in this mix. It still is a very vendor platform. Um, I don't think 28, this is going to be funny, but I don't think 2018 is the year of serverless um, because I think that it still ends up being a, a per platform thing. Um, it's amazingly powerful. People should be using it. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm, we use, uh, Racken uses Lambda, API Gateway, Cognito, and Dynamo as a, our, our SaaS application stack. Um, and we get a lot of benefit from it. I, that, the say, that said, it's not at a place where it can be adopted on private infrastructures that easily. There's a whole bunch of options and alternatives, and it's not clear if it's under Kubernetes or over Kubernetes or a standard completely. So, uh, 2018 is, is not the year of serverless at this point um, from a from a private perspective. Um, if you're using Amazon and not or one of the clouds not using their serverless platform, then then rethink your architecture. Um, you should be using it to some extent. It's it's powerful and locking and has nice to, it has a high amount of lock in for you. So just be so, warned. So let's go yeah. to one more topic that I think um, you know. And this podcast, to me, has become the home of the Edge Computing Podcast. Ah, yeah. I mean, uh, we everyone, you know, obviously we talk to the folks that we bring on, and and you mention Edge, and they all they all get excited. So we end up talking Edge a lot. What is is Edge going to be next year? Uh, I I'm not that optimistic that 2018 is the year of the Edge. Um, from that perspective. Uh, there's a whole bunch of new stuff coming in with Edge, like OpenStack seems to be pivoting a lot of their resources, and I'm very enthusiastic about this, towards Edge infrastructures. Um, but their Edge conversations tend to be, how do we take our existing bloated uh, IaaS code, um, and sorry, it's, it is bloated for an Edge use case, and translate it into this new use cases that weren't imagined five years ago when the code was being developed. Um, so I, I think Edge has still got a ways to go, um, both in, in coalescing around the definition and then um, actually building it. The, the people that we talk to get very excited about Edge, and they're going to spend a lot of time with Edge, and we're going to be – we're going to talk about Edge a lot. This podcast will talk about Edge a lot. Right. Um, I don't think that the broader – industry you know, broader IT industry which hopefully we have a lot of people excited about that and hearing good things in this podcast too are gonna go say oh I need to build edge infrastructure um, we have we, we haven't consolidated what that means enough to grab people's attention we don't have real use cases um, more enough generalized use cases where it makes sense that you would care where things are going um, 
And so I, I think that we sort of have to bang around in the in in the edge communities to build some build some tooling and platforms and things like that before it becomes really attractive. Um, so yeah, does think, that make sense? Yeah, it does. And I think for our listeners, uh, Rob and I have an advantage is we've recorded a podcast with Stephen O'Donnell out of uh, the UK. And he gave the most complete definition of what edge is with, I think it was 24, 25 use cases. <laughs> and it was a good seven, eight minutes. So if you're listening and you want to know about edge uh, in January, when Stephen O'Donnell's podcast comes out, it is the complete thorough edge computing definition. The, I mean, well beyond uh, Rob's standard of it's not cloud, it's edge. Um, it's a bit, it, it, I mean, it goes into detail. So uh, that's a real highlight coming next year. Uh, because I think Steve Stephen did a great job talking about it, and and I think for us looking at what we're going to talk about in 2018, which will definitely be edge related, mm -hmm. um, and you know probably bring, start bringing in some SRE concepts into into edge. Also, I think it's a part of our job to help define this in a use case way that that translates besides some pretty narrow use cases. Um, it, well, I so think that, that people can understand, yeah. I mean, his concept that Edge is going to deliver a bunch of services that you can build on top of and the way he compares it to a cell phone. Again, I'll preview for this podcast, but you build services on top of other services provided from the Edge. Was, it was quite smart. And uh, so we'll, I think we'll leave it at that for a preview. And I do have one last question. And, you know, yeah. because we, we both come from histories of OpenStack early, histories. Mm -hmm. I thought I was there early. You were there earlier before it was even OpenStack. And, um, you know, I know you went to OpenStack Edge event and, um, you know, you're, I believe you're going to be, uh, you're, I think you were nominated to get back on the OpenStack Foundation. I am, I am, I'm running for the board in 2018. Yeah. That'll so happen in, in the first week of January. So, so we're not, on. so if you listen to this, we're not saying you have to vote for Rob, but can you give your thoughts but, but, on OpenStack for, for next year? And uh, I, I think that'll be a, a kind of a good way for us to, you know, end our podcast because because you're going, you're trying to go back in. So let's get your thoughts on what, what back into the community. Yeah. Um, and I've always been in the community. It's, sure. it's a matter of, of leadership. Mm -hmm. So OpenStack uh, just has, ha, is starting to split the foundation to not just support the OpenStack code base, right? Nova, Glance, Ironic. Mm -hmm. Neutron, all, all, all that stuff, and have recognized the big tent, which I was never in favor of, was confusing at best, harmful in a lot of cases. And so the, the new direction for the foundation to go is to, is to focus on open infrastructure. So open infrastructure, there's a big community in OpenStack of open infrastructure people, telcos and cloud providers and research organizations, right? Companies in general, they want to be able to use commodity hardware, even open hardware, and then they want to be able to put open source software on top of it and, and, and build infrastructure. And that's not all virtualized IaaS infrastructure with the OpenStack project code. It could be Kubernetes, it could be serverless technologies, it could be just bare metal work. And so OpenStack Foundation recognizes that that community, and I wrote a blog post about this that, that's, mm -hmm. that goes into depth, that community needs a place to collaborate and meet and build things. Um, and I believe that that's exactly the right thing for OpenStack. I think that that's actually what OpenStack's mission was. We spent a couple of years confused because we, we got too tied up into the code base that we were building and not into the community that we were doing. And so, yeah, from getting back on the board, I, I think it's going to require really hard decisions to do this. Somebody's going to have to stand up and say, stop injecting OpenStack code into these new communities. Let them figure out their solutions. And I think that it's going to take somebody who's been in the community and out of the community, somebody who understands the Kubernetes pieces and operational needs to help you know, reorganize uh, the OpenStack foundation around an open infrastructure mandate. And so, yeah, that's my, my goal for the board is to help sort of, you know, steer that, um, stand up and say, wait a second, you know, dude, it's going to take, it's going to take somebody actually standing up and saying, wait, that you're not talking about this fairly. You're not listening the right ways. And that post you wrote is on the new stack, right? 
so I wrote a piece on the new stack comparing OpenStack and Kubernetes that, and that, sort of that goes, came out goes, this week. That came out that came out this week. The seven seven ways that Kubernetes is not repeating OpenStack sins is sort of the way it, the way it comes out. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> and, um, the I, I wrote a different piece after Australia talking about this pivot to open infrastructure and why that was important. And we'll re, I'll repost that on the robhirschfeld.com blog as part of going out for office. But you know, just to look at look at the next year for OpenStack. This is the operative question, right? OpenStack has a whole bunch of new projects and new ways of doing it, very developer focused things like Kubernetes, sort of in it, entering its ecosystem in a very pragmatic way. And OpenStack is, is really an infrastructure focused thing. It's a community that cares about infrastructure, um, cares about operations, right? Those are, those are bread and butter topics for OpenStack. Frankly, they're not bread and butter topics for Kubernetes. Most Kubernetes vendors are actually black box, you know, cloud infrastructures that are proprietary. And so there is a real opportunity, there's a real need for people who want to talk about open infrastructure and transparency and the type of, you know, on-premises infrastructure, colo infrastructure, even, you know, certain types of public cloud where it's, it's, built on a different set of principles than Amazon is built on, meaning transparency, governance, and community, um, hopefully based on the same operational principles, scale, and ease of use. But this is, this is a really important thing. If, if we're not careful and protect that type of, of infrastructure, then we will turn all of our infrastructure needs over to companies that fundamentally, you know, hide and, and own that infrastructure and it'll feel very much like we're going you know, i think it'll ultimately feel very much like we're going back to ibm mainframes which is not bad but it ends up being much more monoculture um, and I, I i'm a big believer that innovation comes from a whole bunch of small people being able to collaborate or take something and and, and run with it uh, that said we have to figure out monetization strategies for open source Mm -hmm. um, and so if companies want this stuff to work and open infrastructure communities to work, they're going to have to make um, investments, not count on vendors to have deep pockets. But it's just open source moving to new thing beyond just basic code. And uh, it's a maturation of the open source movement, I guess. But maybe that's another podcast. That would be a really interesting one to talk through um, how, how open source is different than code and what open communities look like. Um, so, and why why they're important so so we can continue to do this so but i i, I better wrap it up so I, I just wanted to say uh to our listeners thank you um rob believe it or not this is our 21st podcast we've done we are on a every week we can podcast. now drink during the podcast <laughs> we are on an every week podcast release which is pretty good but don't worry listeners i've I am constantly on the prowl to get new guests. And if you're listening and you want to participate, or you know someone who should be, you'd like, or you have a topic, you know, reach out to Steven Spector, reach out to me, uh, Stephen at rackend.com. And I am happy to talk to you. You know, one of the biggest things when you manage a podcast is finding guests. And, uh, you know, Rob and I know a lot of people, so we do our best, but we're always looking to talk to new people. That makes it even more interesting. And uh, Rob, thank you again for, uh, you know, the opportunity you gave me to help put this together. And, um, you know, I look forward to next year of, uh, you know, really pounding out. I saw someone, I don't remember who it was, just celebrated. I think it was their millionth listener, some, some crazy number like that. Um, that was Sam Charrington. Sam's, yeah. yeah. So um, our goal for Which next year. He's, he's, he's podcasting on AI topics. So if you're interested in AI and machine learning, he is the he is the boss of that. Um, a million listens to his content. It's amazing. And blows me away. So my goal next year is not a million, but but <laughs> cer certainly you know we're heading to a thousand now. So you know if we could get ourselves to ten thousand, I think I think you know ten time increase uh, will be good. So um, you know, but it only works because of our listeners and because uh, we produce uh, the content they need. So reach out to us. And again, Rob, have a um, you know, great holidays, a happy new year to you and your family. And to our listeners, uh, safe and happy new years. And uh, we look forward to uh, you know, engaging with you next year. And again, 
engage with us in real time, not just listening. We're happy to uh, communicate back. Twitter wars. We're all about them. <laughs> <laughs> happy, happy 2018, everyone. Thanks, Stephen. All right. Thanks a lot.